Good morning. Good morning. Woo, let's try that one more time. Good morning. good morning. It is good to be together in the house of the Lord today to worship the Lord together and to see one another. Isaiah the prophet penned these words and I think they're words that we can find comfort in today. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, it's a very familiar passage. It's one of my favorites where the Lord said, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will help you. Yes, I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. The good news is, is that God is good, and he's always with you. And we don't have to fear because he's there. Now, I know it seems like we're in some crazy stuff. Depends on what day you turn the news on or what channel you look on, it gets quite frightening. But can I just remind you that God got here first and he is mindful of everything. And if God's not wigging out, then we don't need to either. We can find rest in him because he's eternal and all this is just simply a temporary space of dwelling. Let's stand together as we go before the Lord today as we prepare to worship him. Once again, if you have a prayer need that you would like to be uh, mentioned during our time of corporate cry out, just simply grab that form and bring it to the front, lay it on the altar, or you can fill it out uh, online if you wish to do that as well. But let's ask the Lord to speak to us today that we might be lifted and challenged by his word as he deals with our hearts today about the world that we're living in and the road that we are navigating our best on today. Father, thank you for this privilege that we have. You are good. Hey, or our folks online, we just simply ask that you would be glorified, that you would help us in the space that we occupy, this temporary space that we occupy. Let your presence move among your people today as they lift your name. Would you speak to us? Would you challenge us? Would you change us so that we might reflect your image in the earth today? And we'll bless you forever for what you do, for you are good and your mercy indeed endures to all generations, through Christ Jesus our Lord and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Remain standing for worship.
joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul there's beauty in my brokenness I've got true love instead joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul and you give me joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul never been so free been more secure knowing your heart Lord never been so free caught in your love for me never been more secure knowing your heart Lord I've never been so free caught in your love for me I've never been more secure knowing your me joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul and you give me joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul never been so free been more secure knowing your heart Lord never been so free caught in your love for me I've never been more secure knowing your heart Lord I've never been so free caught in your love for me I've never been more secure been so free caught in your love for me i've never been more secure knowing your you give me joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul and you give me joy down deep in my soul So thankful for the joy of the Lord, amen. We're going to do a new song this morning. It just says we're going to let our worship be a weapon. Do you agree with that? When it feels like the world is against you, and it feels like you just don't think you're going to make it, we always have our worship. And that's the greatest tool that we have against the enemy, right? So this morning, let's join together and let's let our worship be that weapon to fight against the enemy. Okay, let's do that together this morning.
Cross. 
know, Jesus said that in this life you will have trouble. It's not a you might, you will have trouble. And whenever you've been in a storm, I believe that I can say this with a pretty good assurance that when you are in a storm, you desperately want someone to lift your name and to pray and to stand in the gap and say, God, would you give them peace? God, would you touch them? Would you go before them? Would you do something that they cannot do? How many of you, when you go through a storm, you want people praying for you, holding you, okay? Others of you don't, I guess, okay. Now, here's, here's the thing. Oftentimes, when we pray for others, having not gone through what they've gone through, we sometimes become very passive in the prayer. But as we stand in moments like this, and even the folks that are joining us at home, and we call specific needs out, when we pray, I want you to pray and ask the Lord standing in the gap as though the need were yours. And if we're honest, as a community of faith, we are to bear one another's burdens. That's what the scripture says to all of us. And so this morning as we pray, Pastor Keith and Sheila need peace and wisdom from the Lord as they transition in their life with their family having pastored 31 years. We need to pray for a precious baby, baby Brielle Spees, that God would touch and heal her not very old. I want to continue to pray for Emily Whited, her and her family as she continues to recover and that God would touch her and her finances. They at one point came to church here. We want to remember Ida O'Sullivan, that's Mary's mom. She's going to be going in for a needle biopsy and our prayer is that it would be negative and that they would find nothing that is overly concerning. How many of you standing here today say, Pastor, there's a need. I just didn't want to write it down. But God knows what it is. We call it unspoken. Can I just see a hand? Yeah. Yeah. So God knows what those things are. Let's just take a moment and let's talk to the Lord about the needs that have been presented, the needs that only he knows about. And let's fervently ask God to move. Father, I don't have an answer. We don't have an answer other than your word. We struggle with peace on this earth because of all the stuff. And I just, we just ask you today that you would move upon the needs, the, the ones that we didn't even speak out loud, that our hearts scream to you, the needs for clarity, the needs for wisdom, the needs for discernment, the needs for provision. I thank you, Lord, that you are still all sufficient, that you're still able to do far above anything we could ever ask or think. These needs that we've lifted to you today, we pray for Ida tonight, that God, you would minister to her and you would move upon her. Lord, oftentimes, even when the light shines around us because of possibilities and theories that run through our mind, it seems like the bleakest of darkness and night around us. So would you minister to her and give her peace first and foremost? And we pray, Lord, that all things would come back negative and that, that there would be nothing to alarm her or her family with. We pray, oh Lord, for this pastor and his precious family that you would give them wisdom and enable them as they transition to uh, find your peace and your directives in their life if you, as you have led them some 31 years as they've served you. Father, for this precious baby, Lord, you know best how to heal. And we pray, oh God, for this precious baby, Brielle, that you would minister to her and that you would touch her and that you would touch the family and give them strength and grace in their time of need. Thank you, Lord, that you're touching Emily and her family and the steps that she's had to walk through here recently, God, have been quite challenging and difficult. But I thank you, Lord, that you are still the very present help in time of need. Lord, touch and illuminate our understanding today. Help us to see the moments that we have all misstepped before you. Wash over us, O oh God, and help us to stay and walk in humility with repentance before you. We pray for our country, we pray for our state, we pray for the leaders and governing places that you would touch them. We are still navigating in difficult and uncharted territories. 
and we need your help. We have more and more of people that profess your name fighting over things that should never have been something to divide your people. And yet we're fighting about it. Help us by your word and through your presence and your spirit to be quickened again, reminded of that which is eternal and important. Help our eyes to be steadfastly locked upon your word, knowing that the enemy desires at every turn to distort it and to turn our eyes away from you. Help us as we look to you. And in these moments, as we continue to just lift our eyes to you, settle our heart, calm our fears, be glorified as we lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets or ensnares us. Oh God, let us run the race that is set before us with perseverance. For what you do will give you honor and glory and praise, but help us not to lose sight in these critical moments, lest we fall short of the finish line and fail to obtain the prize that is eternal and well outside the scope of the temporary. We'll give you thanks for who you are, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. I choose to worship. I choose to bow. Though there's pain in the offering, I let it down.
just for a moment, right where you are. One hand, both hands, it doesn't matter to me, I'm not gonna be watching you. But one hand or both, just right where you're standing with your words, would you just express thanksgiving to the Lord right where you're standing? Thank you, Lord, for your good. You're so good. Your mercy is everlasting, it endures. We look to you, the creator of all things, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord. Lord, would you somehow get our eyes back on track? Remind us again of eternal things. We have been like your disciples. Many have been going and coming and going and coming and going and coming and going and not even having time enough to eat and frustration has settled in. And we must walk in thanksgiving to you and in authentic worship with our lives lining up to your word. Forgive us for our missteps, for the moments that we've missed along the way because we were frustrated at a political paradigm, frustrated at a leader, frustrated at a decision, frustrated because we felt our rights were somehow walked on all these things that have distracted us turn our eyes again to you the author and the finisher of our faith help us to walk in true humility giving preference one to another while keeping our eyes focused upon you I pray for every family represented here in this space today and those that are joining us both live and later would you give them grace to endure all things and we'll give you thanks for the strength that you alone give through jesus christ our lord and all god's people said amen, amen. Before you're seated, I, I know we're not going to go walking around and hugging and handshaking and all that kind of good stuff, although I know some of you have no problem with it, and that's okay. Would you just turn around and catch the eyes of someone and just kind of smile at them and, and just wave? Just go ahead and smile at a couple folks if you don't mind. Just be, be a little friendly. See, that doesn't, that's not hard at all. Praise the Lord. Look how easy that is. Very good. And then after you do that, you can be seated this morning. I'm gonna ask an awkward question. Are you ready for an awkward question? Have you noticed how awkward it feels? And the difference when we come into the house of God now, it's almost like we're confused and, and trying to figure out stuff. And it's almost this awkwardness that comes upon the body of Christ. And it's not just here at Healing Waters, but it is in many, many other places as everyone tries to figure this thing of what we're going through out. But it's going to be okay. And we will make it through together. I'm delighted this morning to have back with us Pastor Steve and Janet Carpenter. They've been gone for what seems like forever. They left last year towards the end of 2019 and just got back home this week. And so we are delighted to, that they are back. Would you, would you like to stand and greet the people and say hi and all that kind of good stuff? You can come on up here if you want. Grab a microphone so everybody can hear you online.
There you go. Uh, Technology, I tell you. So, we're really back now. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, um, we were expecting to do a lot more uh, sightseeing around while we was out there, but, you know, this all happened. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things. We're happy to be back. Um, we've enjoyed our time. It's a, gosh, it's, it's something different when, when uh, you can just get away from everything and then you go to a different place and you feel like you're visiting while you're working for uh, eight months. Um, but it's, it was eight months. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We left in November, right before Thanksgiving. That's, yeah. I yeah. guess it is eight months. Yeah. So, thank you um, for uh, your messages while we was gone. Uh, we, we missed you, and we appreciated those. And uh, it's good to be back, and uh, we're ready to get to work. Awesome. Good stuff. Janet, did you want to say anything? No. Okay, very good. <laughs> She's so excited to be home. Listen, uh, following the service this morning, uh, we have a, just a small, light, little refreshment time um, for those of you that would like to stick around and socially distance yourselves and, and uh, speak a word of kindness and uh, encouragement to them. Uh, that will be available following the service. So I hope they stick around because that would be awkward, wouldn't it, if they left? <laughs> But uh, we're, we're grateful for them. And one of the things that they have been very, very uh, helpful with, you know, the videos that we show each week uh, for our kids that's important to us, uh, they, they, are sending, they have been sending those videos to me uh, each week. So uh, I am grateful to them. Uh, this one that we have been in today is part three of the life of Joseph. And I have, uh, I'll tell you what, I... I love these videos. I love the insight it gives to all of this, all of us. Let me just say this for you. Moms, dads, grandmas, granddads, aunts, uncles, friends, family members, both near and far. These videos are a starting place. They are not the end all and be all. It does not tell all of the story, but it gives highlights in a lot of places. Fill in those gaps. Teach your children. Um, it's great to have technology, but moms and dads and family members and friends, you are the front line. And I will tell you, the enemy is uh, after our younger generation more so today than I think any other time. And I think what's interesting is we say that every generation. And it's just like it, it continues to get worse. Yeah, because the world's getting not getting any better. And uh, our hope is not in these places on earth. So without further ado, I'm going to draw your attention, both old and young alike, to Joseph, the third and final chapter of this video. It's time for a Bible story. The story of Joseph, part three. Do you need another refresher to get you caught up to speed on what happened last time? Nah, man, I got this. Check it out. I'm going to do a rapid fire recap. Ready? Go. <gasps> Joseph had 11 brothers and they were jerks. And then he had some dreams where everything was bowing down to him and his brothers threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And then he worked for Potiphar and then Potiphar's wife was a big jerk face and lied about him and threw him into jail. Boom. Wow, that was actually pretty impressive. And yes, that's exactly where our story picks up. Joseph was wrongfully accused and thrown into jail, but it wasn't just a regular jail. This was a prison where all of the king's prisoners were sent. So it was extra secure. There is no way anyone was getting out of this place. Yeesh, so I guess that's about it for old Joseph, huh? Well, it was fun while it lasted. The end. No way, man. This is totally not the end of the story. Even though it looked like his situation was getting worse, the Lord gave Joseph great favor with everyone around him. The guards liked Joseph so much that they let him help out around the prison, they didn't even lock him up. Whoa, that's crazy. So that's what you mean when you were saying that through this whole deal, the Lord was with him? You bet. Because Joseph had a great attitude, was respectful and cared about other people, his time spent in prison wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. In fact, Joseph was so good at noticing people around him and going out of his way to care about them that one day something happened that would change his life big time. Oh yeah, you said last time there was this big thing coming up. Is this it? Yep. And you're not gonna get me with another to be continued, are you? Well, I'll let you know next time. To be continued. Ah, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah, I was just joking. We're not done yet. Whew, thank goodness. Really got me good there. So what happened? Since this prison was where all of the king's prisoners were sent, there were two men that used to work directly for the Pharaoh. One was a baker, the other was a cup bearer. Wait, a cup bearer? His job was to put bears in cups? That sounds hard. You gotta either have some big old cups 
were some tiny bears. No, he wasn't a bear cupper. He was a cup bearer. That meant that he would serve drinks to the pharaoh in a cup. Eh, uh, gotcha, that makes more sense. So these guys were in jail, huh? Yep. Since Joseph was in charge of the prison, the guards assigned these two guys to him. Then, one night, both the baker and the cupbearer each had some pretty strange dreams. Oh, boy, here we go again with the dreams. Oh, speaking of dreams, last night I had this crazy dream where my ears turned into chili dogs. No, uh-uh. I don't want to hear any more about your crazy dreams. We're talking about their dreams. The next day, Joseph could tell that something was bothering them. Both the cupbearer and the baker looked like they didn't sleep very well and were all stressed out. Well, I mean, they are in prison, not exactly a stress-free environment. Yeah, but this was different. Joseph was very good at noticing people around him and caring about them. So he asked them what was bothering them. They told him that they had some very strange dreams, but didn't know what they meant. I know what my dream meant, that I shouldn't eat chili cheese dogs right before I go to sleep. Well, that's true. But when Joseph heard that they were troubled by their dreams, he thought of something. Back home, God helped Joseph understand what his dreams meant, so he offered to help interpret the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer. Hey, look at that. Joseph's in jail. These guys go there, too. Joseph can interpret dreams. These guys have dreams that need to be interpreted. You weren't kidding about God having a plan for Joseph's life, huh? Exactly. The cupbearer and the baker both told Joseph what their dreams were, and God revealed to Joseph what those dreams meant. The cupbearer's dream was about a vine and three branches that sprouted grapes, and he squeezed those grapes into the Pharaoh's cup. Joseph told him what that meant, that in three days, he would be released and would go back to his job serving drinks to the Pharaoh. Good for him, that's awesome. So what about the baker's dream? In the baker's dream, there were three baskets of bread sitting on top of his head. A bunch of birds flew up and started eating out of one of them. Unfortunately, Joseph told him that this meant that in three days, the Pharaoh would have him killed. Yikes, classic case of the old good news, bad news, huh? Did those things come true? They sure did. Three days later, the cupbearer was restored back to his job and the baker was, well, let's just say he sleeps with the fishes. What? Gross, why would you sleep in a pile of fish? Ugh, that was more terrible. No, like, you know, he took a dirt nap. Wait, now he's sleeping in the dirt? I mean, that's better than a pile of fish, but still, just sleep in a bed, dude. No, he died. Oh, gotcha. Took a double dip out of the old cosmic cookie jar, huh? Yeah, that's not a phrase. Never mind. So what happened next? Those guys just left and Joseph stayed in jail? Not exactly. Before the cupbearer left, Joseph asked him to tell the pharaoh about his situation, that he was wrongfully accused of something that he didn't do and thrown into jail. Oh, awesome. This is his chance to get set free. Did the cupbearer remember to tell the pharaoh about him? Uh, no. He forgot. What? You gotta be joking me. So Joseph just stays in prison? Bummer. He did for a while, but not forever. Two years after the cupbearer was released, something happened with Pharaoh. He had some strange dreams and didn't know what they meant. It really bothered him. Hey, this sounds familiar. Someone had a strange dream that needs to be interpreted. Who are you gonna call? Dream Buster! The Pharaoh got all of his wise men, sages, and the magicians together and told them to interpret the dream, but none of them knew what it meant. Then, all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembered that Joseph can interpret dreams. Yes, it's about time you remember about him. Tell the Pharaoh, tell the Pharaoh! That's exactly what he did. Pharaoh called for Joseph to be brought before him and explained what the dreams were. In one dream, there were seven fat, healthy cows standing by the Nile River. Then seven skinny, ugly cows came out of the river and ate up the fat cows. Uh, hold on. Why are you giving me all the grief for my dreams? That was the weirdest dream I've ever heard. The Pharaoh also dreamed that there was a stock of wheat with seven healthy heads of grain. Then seven other heads of grain sprouted that were thin and sun-scorched and they swallowed up the healthy grains. Whoa, talk about weird dreams. Joseph's really got his work cut out for him, huh? What in the world did those mean? God revealed to Joseph what the dreams meant and he told Pharaoh everything. He said that there would be seven years of plenty in the land of Egypt with more than enough food for everyone. But after after that, there would be seven years of famine where there would be nothing to eat. Whoa, uh, that's pretty serious. So, like, what did Pharaoh do? He was so relieved to know what the dreams meant. He was also so glad to know that the famine was coming in seven years so everyone could start preparing and storing up food. Awesome! But wait, what happened to Joseph? Please don't tell me he goes back to jail. If he goes back to jail, I'm just gonna start swinging. No, he didn't go back to jail. 
The Pharaoh was so impressed with Joseph that he gave him a job. Pharaoh made Joseph second in command over all of Egypt. What? Seriously? The big number two? Second in command? That is awesome. Yeah, man. The only person in the entire country with more power than Joseph was Pharaoh himself. Man, that is pretty incredible. You were totally right about God having big plans for Joseph's life. Doesn't get much bigger than that. No kidding. Joseph's life was totally changed. And it probably wouldn't have happened like that if he didn't notice the people around him back when he was in jail. And something else was about to happen that nobody expected. Nice try. I see you coming a mile away. You're about to do another to be continued, aren't you? I sure am. Bam. Yep, I called it. Totally called it. What's, what's amazing about these videos is that's actually the kind of conversation that would take place if you're talking with kids. They would be interjecting and asking interesting questions throughout. So uh, we, are, we are grateful for technology and being able to uh, integrate that in service as well. I know several are asking, when are we going to get back to normal? Uh, we will let you know when that time comes. I know that there are a lot of questions from kids stuff to midweek services. Let's just stay the course, stay calm, stay kind, and don't let the stuff get in your head that makes you not so sane and not so kind uh, as we move forward. Romans chapter 15 is where we're going to go together today. And as you're turning there, I'm afraid that we are so distracted we forget the lost. And we forget the lost in such a regard that the busyness of everyday life, the interactions of everyday life are filled with more anxiety and strain than they are filled with being hope, help, and healing through Christ Jesus to the world around us. We're going to look at Romans chapter 15, but I found an interesting media clip. I have no doubt that before all this stuff took place, that many people went to restaurants and went to different places and had a lot of interaction. I think we have to get back to the passion for lost people and realize that sometimes the only Jesus they're going to hear and see is the one that we present through the word of God being alive and living through our lives. So we're going to go in just a moment, Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Before we do, I want you to watch this short clip and just see what the Lord is saying to us today. Every Sunday I see you guys come in here from your church and don't get Every Sunday I see you guys come in here from your church and don't get me started on your tipping. You girls got to eat, right? It's just a little server humor there. But seriously, I don't know everything that goes on in there, but I know something does because I hear you. Every time I drop by your table, I hear how great the message was from the pastor and how you wish more people would hear it. Well, I don't go to your church, so how am I going to hear it? All I got is you. So are you going to share it with me or just hope I stumble through the doors of your church with my sinful self? Well, since I have you here right now, I guess I can talk to you since it seems like You're not ready to talk to me. Well, but you're ready to judge me, my hair, my clothes, my language, my music. I know that you don't mean for it to come across that way, but you have to see how it looks from my side. You think I have a problem, that my life needs fixing, that there's something missing in it and you have it, or at least you know what can fill that missing part. Okay, yeah. There's a part of my life that needs to be filled with something. But believe me, I've tried. I've tried to figure out what would make me happy. I've tried to figure out what would, I don't know, not make me feel like I'm worthless. Okay, so I'm not the greatest of people. But 
If I'm so lost and so far gone, aren't you the one that's supposed to help me? Aren't you the one with this so-called good news that is supposed to tell me the truth? Because what I've been trying is not working. And I need to know that there is more than just coming in here every day, serving you your coffee and pancakes to your lovely family. I need to know that there is more to my life than this. And guess what? You have to be the one because no one else is saying the things you say. How much do you have to hate someone to keep what you have to yourself and your family? How much do you have to like your own comfort to leave me to myself? I need you, okay, said it. And if you think that that was easy for me to say, then you try living my life. I need you to pursue me. I need you to set aside your comfort and pursue me because I'll run. When I get scared, I run and you have to come after me. You have to follow me into the darkness and show me the way out because you were there once. You went from death to life. And I know that those are your words, but if it's true, then this is more important than your safety and your ego. Oh, I'm still gonna call you a Bible thumper and I'm probably gonna make fun of you, but don't give up on me. Okay, talk it over, I've got tables. It's your move. I'm afraid that in the craziness of our day, we are slowly yet in some ways rapidly forgetting who we are and why you have been saved by grace. There is a world that is around us that is hurting, that is dying, and even more now confused over more than in any other time in the known history that we've ever been a part of. We are living in it. And we are distracted by all kinds of things. And this might make some people a little irritated today. Not my first time. <laughs> we are distracted by things. We are pulled by things. We're battling mindsets of all kinds of rampant foolishness. And the darkness that spirals in the life of the unbeliever continues to spiral. And we are being spun by our own distractions and wondering when is it all going to end and come quickly, Lord Jesus. And while I share such sentiment, I want to see those that are in darkness come to know him before their end is too late for them to have come to know him. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, I'll be reading to you today from the New American Standard Bible. I'm just simply saying we, we can't forget. We cannot lose our hope. Verse 1, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. 
Verse 10, and he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Father, would you help us with your word to chew on it today and to gain wisdom? As you did then, also do now. Remind us yet again of the lost. Remind us yet again of the mindset that we must have in unity and in a harmonic blend in your kingdom with the mind of Christ, remind us again today, lest we become more and more distracted by the pollution and craziness of our day. As many are walking around seeing blindly, help us to once again hear and see the broken, lost world in front of us and forgive us for willfully becoming deaf and blind to their plight. We'll thank you forever for what you accomplish. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. I've wrestled with this this week. I've wrestled over the reality that we are in fact distracted like crazy. I'll give you some points of our distractions and some of the contentions therein, we, we're, we're fighting over this right now. If you, if you wear a mask, you're a crazy conformist. If you don't wear a mask, bless God, you hate people. And we are distracted politicizing everything in America has caused the church to stop preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel because everybody wants to fight about Republican and Democrat procedures and policies. Oh, we'll post about it, we'll share about it, and the lost are scrolling through your streams. Well, I think wearing a mask is stupid. Well, don't let me get started on this thing. Let me tell you what I think is stupid, and I just can't, and the world is watching a church, a people, consume itself and implode. Why? Because the enemy's doing today what he's always done as he turns the church in upon itself so that he can prevent the message of hope, help, and healing through Christ Jesus to get out on the streets. I'll give you a forewarning, not of what I'm saying today because it's gonna be coming out in the newspaper this coming Wednesday, I'm told, this new organization that we have endeavored to form in this particular county called PAIR, it's the acrostic of the word parishes or pastors affirming racial equity and dealing and grappling with some of these things because I've had people say to me, well, in your position, why don't you do something other than just talk about it? I am. Why don't you do something other than just talk about it? Isn't it easier to point fingers at other people? You see how that feels when it's reversed? Makes you uncomfortable, makes you mad. But everybody else is supposed to take the foolishness. I don't know how they're gonna report on it, but here's the ultimate goal. In the fullness of time, my goal, 
our goal, I believe, from the Lord is to have, you, do you know that right now is the most segregated time in the, in the United States? Right now in, in church is the most segregated time. White church, black church, Hispanic church, and all the other lists. If I forgot one, that did, did, go ahead and get mad. I just can't remember them all. My mind's racing right now as I try not to step on myself as I'm trying to bring what I've had the Lord deal with my heart on. The ultimate goal, I want to get red, yellow, black, white, everybody in one place to worship God and have a time of reconciliation and healing that we can all again look together to the cross and see some sense of hope and healing. Not looking in our rearview mirror. You can't move forward while looking in the rearview mirror. I did say that to the, to the press, by the way. I'm not sure how that's going to get interpreted, but that's how I said it. But I'm afraid that we are now living in a culture where it's easy to point a finger at somebody else and berate them and accuse them and blame them when, guess what, we are all in the pool of blame. The world is in the condition that is in, and I, I know this is not, maybe some folks have tuned it out completely online to already. Maybe you have tuned out a little bit, but I, I pray you haven't because there are people that are dying and we use to pray, God, heal the broken world through us. Now, our prayer is, God, just let me get on through and let me make it. Let me make it. Everything has become self-centered. In verse 1, he says that we must bear one another's burden. I, I just submit to you that we don't do that real well. And the problem in the church is when you do help bear somebody's burden, there's the flesh side of it that says, well, bless God, I'm going to get everything I can. I'm going to squeeze that lemon for every ounce of juice I can get. And then everybody says, well, I'm not helping anybody else because that's all they want to do is take advantage of people. And every time you turn and you see the mindset that we get into, it's all over the place. I didn't want to preach this. I actually said, Lord, I'm going to tell Pastor Steve since he's back this Sunday, let him preach. I'm serious because I didn't want to, I don't want to preach this. My flesh this whole morning has been screaming, tone it down, tone it down. But the spiritual side of me says, let it go, <laughs> let it go. But we are, we, we are so consumed with our own isms that we can't even bear one another's burdens because we're afraid somebody's going to take advantage of us. So what? And when they do take advantage of us, we talk about them. The whole time we don't understand that the world is watching the church. I'm not ignorant to believe. I know people slander and badmouth me all the time, even people that know my heart. And that's okay. If they're talking about me, they're leaving somebody else alone. I'm a big boy. I've got thick skin. I'm not a fool. My concern is not with the ones that are <laughs> Because they're going to do that. And if they don't repent of that foolishness, that gets, gets us into craziness. Our problem is, is we've turned our weapons against one another instead of going out into the world where the lost people are hurting, dying, crying, and reaching them. We are consuming one another without even shedding the light on the world around us. And Paul says to them very first, he says, listen, we who are strong all bear one another's burdens or weaknesses. One translation says it like this. You who are strong must be considerate of those that are sensitive about many things. Uh-huh. I, I know, I can hear some of that. I don't like that translation. <laughs> Too many sensitive around here. I'm just, some people just ought to grow up, blah, blah, blah. Do you know how angry you get when someone says that about you and yet we readily say it about other people? But they need to grow up. Mirror, mirror. I'm not going to say the rest of that because then I'll get accused of citing some crazy demonic chant in a cartoon. <laughs> we got to be considerate. We've lost the whole consideration of one another bearing one another's burdens. We don't take time to do that anymore because we're busy and the mindset is I'm going to get mine 
And hopefully somehow God will give you yours, but I'm going to get mine, and then we throw on the bless God, hallelujah. I'm only going to touch on a couple things in this passage that we've read today. But Paul's writing to them, and listen, if he's writing to them, he's reminding them in this whole passage, not for the first time, he's not giving up, he's reminding them again, which means he's reminded them already, and he's initially talked to them and told them something. How many of you have children? How many of you have had to tell them once? Twice. Three times. Four times. Five. Lost count. If I tell you one more time, I'm gonna count to three. One. Two. Dear God, that's the longest second I've ever seen in my life but we've done it in hopes that somehow we'll change. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for some medicine, uh, some sugar to help with this this morning, but I'm afraid that in our quest to be politically astute and politically accurate and politically correct, we've left one another behind. We've stopped praying fervently. We've stopped reaching the harvest. We've stopped sharing the gospel. We'd rather fight about what politics are better in a nation than we would plead with the broken soul that Jesus is the way to healing and sharing with them the hope and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse three, he says, Christ didn't even please himself. I I, I know the argument. Bless God, preacher, I ain't Jesus. But how many times do we hear, let this mind also be in you that was in Christ Jesus? Mindset that's willing to serve other people and lay your life down for other people and love other people and, and adopt thumper theology. You know what thumper theology is. If it ain't something nice, don't say anything at all. We do it all the time. Jesus didn't even please himself. He, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, when Jesus came, he was thinking about you. The writer of Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, the suffering, and the shame. What was the joy set before him? The salvific plan of God being extended to us, to all, as the Bible would say, to whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord should be, shall be saved. <clears throat> we also have this problem on how we classify who's weak and who's strong. I didn't do nothing for them. They're stronger than me. They ought to do for me because I'm weaker than they. Mercy. Yeah, help us, Lord. The problem is, is we're quantifying strength and weakness through the eyes of physical understanding. But weakness, I submit to you, is not identified by your human understanding. It's identified through the lenses of God. And guess how God sees every flesh built person, weak. The truth of the matter is, without him I am nothing. Without his strength I fail. Without his mercy I am mush. Without his grace I'm not good. The only one good is him. I struggle and I need him. And the problem is, as we have adopted this class system, I'm better than you. You are beneath me. We don't say it, but it's a spiritual air that we put on. We promenade around the church house in America with our spiritual nose up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. That's all. He's all right, mama. Don't fuss at him. He's good. I mean, we've even got, look, we've even got our own 
pristine postures in worship. Let me make sure my hands look good while I, let me figure out how I'm going to raise them to where it looks just so spiritual. Let me, I got to make it, I want people to think I'm grabbing towards God. Let me get my grip right. Let me, let me brace myself like I'm really. You think I'm kidding, folks. I know preachers, and I won't call your names because you'll watch it later. I know preachers that have stood in front of the mirror to see which worship pose looks the best for the people to see them in. Be glad I'm discreet in that regard. We'd have the, probably have the parking lot full before we even get out of here if I called their names. They'd go run to somebody tell them in their church, Pastor McCarty said. But we're so concerned with all the wrong stuff and the world around us is dying. They are dying and they are crying and they are hurting and we have lost the hearing. We've lost the ability to hear. Skip on down. I gotta hurry up. Skip at verse five. Now may God who gives us perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. We can't even get on the same mind with church stuff, let alone get on the same mind with Christ. What is Christ Jesus' mind, the lost? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. We struggle getting together on colors. We didn't on this project, thank God. But we get a, well, let's take a vote. Let's, let's do this, and, and we're all over the bat. And then if the vote turns out to be, we're not in the, the, the majority of the vote, now we're offended. Let the, mind, the same mind uh, with one another according to Jesus Christ, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify God. Do you know why oftentimes in America, not only is it the greatest time of segregation, in the land, but it's also the biggest time that we are disjointed in our worship because we're all worshiping God for different reasons. And if we're honest, because of the church on television, many people are worshiping God to get Grand Poobah in the sky to give them something if they get the equation right. Let the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What would it look like if we just all got together? What would it look like? What would it sound like? What would it be like if a disjointed world didn't see a disjointed church? If a disjointed world saw a church that actually walked in what their church attendance proclaimed. They're hurting. I got, man, I got so many notes. I'm not even going to tell you how many pages because I've done, chased a couple of rabbits already today. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, one of the most profound and yet frightening scriptures God said, I look for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so that I would not have to destroy the land. He said, but I didn't find anyone. I, I didn't find one. I didn't find one. And I'm just wondering, have you considered the lost? Have you considered those that are hurting? Have you considered those that are struggling? Have we forgotten the hope that saved us? Hope for the hurting. Hope for the helpless. Hope for the hopeless, hope for the hardened from life, hope for the broken, hope, just hope, just hope of the hope of Jesus Christ. Have we forgotten it and gotten so wrapped up in the politicization of everything that we forgot him? That he's hope for all of us, that he's real. I still remember 12 years old coming to know him and I'm still telling you, Jesus is real. And you know, do you know why so many people don't want to believe in the hope of Christ Jesus? It's because they've seen dis, dis, uh, disassociated, disgruntled, disappointed, 
disconnected and disjointed Christians. Come to know Jesus and they're like, so that I can be like you? We have this hope. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that God has given to us to love the world through Christ Jesus. Not to love them enough to lie to them, but to love them enough that the truth and reality of Jesus Christ and eternity without him and what it looks like. Proverbs 13, 12 tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I can tell you there's a lot of hearts that are sick around the land today. It's because hope hasn't penetrated their heart yet because life is happening at 400 miles an hour and they can't even catch their breath and here we are with the songs of Zion and everything and I'm just simply saying we have got to get back to seeing and hearing the lost and understanding that that is who we have been called to. Verse 15, I'll skip down to verse 15 of our text. He says, I've written very boldly to you on some points to, as to remind you again because of the grace that was given, from me, given me from God that what? You are to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Yes. And you would think that that would be something we know the people of God would automatically know we have been called to reach the lost. We have been called to reach those that don't know Christ. You would think that we would know that, but Paul is having to remind them again. And again. And I'm really afraid of how society is becoming. We're all fighting about things. Do you realize that even in church circles, some of the first questions that people are asked today in the kingdom of God is how do you vote R or D? To already begin the process of divide. And we can't even see anything wrong with it because we've been so entrenched by it. Instead of weighing things by scripture, we weigh things by political party. I know that's not popular, but it is the truth. We gotta get our focus back. Do you remember where you were when he found you? Do you remember the level of hopelessness? Do you remember the bondage that was on the inside of you and the, the fear that was in your mind? Do you remember where you were when his love reached further than man's wisdom could ever go? They're out there, some of them deeper and further in the darkness and some such as I, but his love still reaches further than man's wisdom can ever know. That video messed me up because I thought of how many times I've just gone through the motions of a day and didn't stop to consider the whisper in the soul that says, share with him the love of God in Christ Jesus. Some 2,000 years ago as he hung on the cross, you know the story. Thief on each side. One's cursing him, tell him, get us down from here. The other one's saying, listen, he didn't do anything. Will you remember me when you enter into your kingdom today? And what did Jesus say? Yeah, today, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. And throughout the course of the narrative, he gets to the place and he says, I am thirsty. The hall of praetorium was done. The stripes on his back, the crown on his head, the spikes in his wrist and in his feet, and there he hangs 
And they put this sponge, if you will, and they dip it in the vinegar and the gall, and they put it up to his mouth, and he's, he probably winches away from it and winces away from it when he does. The Bible tells me in John 19, verse 30, that when he had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he gave up, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit in that moment. And I think we forget because life happens to us in that moment, in that instance. There was a bridge that spanned all time and space continuums reaching even to us that gave us a pathway to hope, help, and healing to God through Christ Jesus. Up until that moment, we didn't have it. And I think because we've gotten so entrenched in life, we've forgotten what we have. We don't hear like we once did. I'm closing, I think. We don't hear like we once heard. It's too much noise. We don't see like we once seen, have seen. It's too much on our lenses. Have you ever talked with somebody and you're standing there and maybe you wear glasses, they wear glasses, and you're standing there and you're looking at their glasses and in your mind you're going, I don't know how they see through that. And you want to reach in and hand them a little sticky, not a sticky note, um, that would have been crazy. Why would a sticky note be? You want to hand them something to clean their glasses. You ever been there and you're like, you want to use this? And even if you do, they go, no, I'm fine. See, perfectly. The whole time you're going, and you see perfectly, it looks like you had, anyway, it just doesn't look right. How do you see? I'm afraid that our ears have become tuned to a different sound. And our eyes have been glazed to a different centerpiece in life. Instead of hearing the call, and see, hearing the hurting is also hearing the heartbeat of God. The heartbeat of God, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Now we can't even hear the, the hurting because we're too busy fighting each other, too busy fighting all these other things when if the church would get her hearing back and if the church would clean their lenses, you'd be able to see again, you'd be able to hear again and you would realize all over again, just like you did way back when, whenever that was, that it never really was about you. It was about him the whole time. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. He came looking for me. Came looking for you. Paul says, got to remind you, got to remind you. I encourage you later to look at that passage. He's reminded them of several things in this. One, bear one another's burdens. Be considerate of one another in the church. I mean, it almost makes you go, what? We should know that, but they did. They didn't. They did, but they didn't. They didn't, but they did. It's confusing, isn't it? He had to remind them, get in the same mindset together in Christ Jesus. And he had to remind them to minister to the lost. One of the things that in our Monday night prayer time, it's not, it's not been like a prayer service where somebody's leading something. It's just been a time from 6.30 to 8, people can come and spend 10 minutes, an hour, the whole time, whatever, and pray. And we have different things on the screens that, yes, can remind us of different things. But one of the things that I've prayed is God help us to get back to seeing and hearing the, 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 the howl, if you will, of the hurting. Instead of being consumed with all of our own self. 
I'll say this and then I, I let me shut this off. So stop looking at notes. I'll say this. If the enemy knew exactly what he was doing, look at the gospel that has been preached in the mainstream of the United States, primarily on television. What has the gospel done? It's appealed to your flesh. What you can get now. If you can get the equation right, you can have wealth beyond measure and, and, and never have any more sickness. You can walk in this idea of divine health, but yet the ones preaching it have glasses. I still don't understand some of that. Some of you are like, whoa, I never thought about that until just now. And slowly, here's what the enemy's done. Having itching ears, we have heaped up for ourselves teachers to tell us what we want to hear and what appeals to the flesh. When the whole reality the entire time that has never once changed is the gospel while about you is not about you. It's about you in that he came to die for all of us. But it's not about you in the sense that the gospel is somehow supposed to serve your every whim. He's never been the genie in the lamp. But he has been a savior that conquered death hell and the grave and he's still the only one that can take your brokenness and the brokenness of the world and make it new again I'm just saying today please do not forget hope and his name is Jesus let's stand Father, would you help us? Forgive us for the moments that the gospel became about us. How we can be served. Forgive us for the moments that we followed the shiny object. Forgive us for the moment that we covered our ears from hearing the sound and howl of the hurting so that we heard the desires of our own flesh overriding the sound of the hurting. And for many, they've arrived at a place they don't hear it anymore. Would you clean our ears out spiritually? Would you clean the lenses? Help us to see again, to hear again. And as a body of believers, help us to bear one another's burden and to come together, not fight over foolish things. To be divided over things that should have never divided us all because the enemy Lit little fires. Give us wisdom, O oh God, and discernment. Yes. Discernment in your word. And let a time of refreshing come. To our eyes and our ears process the claim of the hurting for hope and hear and perceive again the deficit in this dark and dreary world and Lord I'm not saying this because I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to have 
more people here in this place. You know that's never mattered to me. I'm saying let your people be a beacon of hope, help, and healing so that people come to know you for all of eternity and they don't leave this temporary place lost for the eternal space. Help us to somehow get back to basic things. For I'm afraid that in our quest for the depths of you, we got lost in things that deceived a generation. Let us be burdened again with what your heart aches for. And to see again the harvest that is white unto harvest. That just simply means it's overripe. And if we don't get to it, it we'll fall off the vine and die. Help us. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that your word tells us that you chasten those that you love. Thank you that we are sons and daughters. Correct our course, I pray. Not only ours, but all that will hear your voice. And for it, we'll be grateful. In Jesus' name. So be on the lookout for the hurting. May God let us hear and see again. We love you. Don't forget, um, Pastor Steve and Janet, why don't y'all go on back there, get ahead of the people so that you're not bull rushed. Let me just say to you, if you go back there, there's refreshments and there's single serve things so you don't have to worry about hands getting on stuff. Everything's prepared to where you don't have to, it's not like a, you know. Anyway, it's all safe stuff. Um, honor the social distancing stuff. Uh, please be respectful of one another. I know it's crazy in this day and time, but they're, they're gonna be even reporting people to government it's just, we're in a day and time that's absolutely crazy. But may God help our focus. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you again soon.